All right, Adam Chris for MMA Barn on the line with mixed martial arts pioneer and UFC Hall of Famer Dan the Beast Severn, gracious enough to give us the privilege to pick his brain about his extensive career, post-retirement, everything included. Mr. Severn, it's an absolute honor. I've been a fan for a long time, and I appreciate you taking the time to talk. Well, I'll tell you there, Adam, I, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, actually excited to be on, on this interview here in first place myself, just so I can let people know what is the beast still up to. Well, there it is. First things first, you had a very detailed and extensive career, which we're, we're going to go into and discuss. What have you been up to since retirement from mixed martial arts and professional fighting? Oh, I tell you what there. Uh, Adam, I don't know how long you want this interview to go, but I could probably go on for days. And it's uh, I, I like to... What, what has been written about me in, in a number of different uh, forms of media, um, that I'm the hardest working guy in the professional wrestling industry, I'm the hardest working guy in the MMA industry, I'm the hardest working guy in the amateur wrestling industry. So I guess bottom line is, I'm the hardest working guy. But I like, the difference though is, I like what I do, so I don't look upon it as work. I'm actually, I'll forgive, give you a perfect example, here I am, I'm, I'm flying, traveling all day uh, yesterday, and I make it into the Phoenix airport uh, late last night, and while I'm waiting for my, my ride, I've got like 15 minutes, so I sent off a quick little mass email to roughly 200 people, and uh, all I know is like this morning, I couldn't wait to jump on the uh, the computer because it's like Christmas, seeing all the good things that continue to come in, so I, 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 am, I am a big believer in karma. What you give is what you get, and I, I've been a giver uh, for decades. And so I'll just say that uh, I live a very charmed life. Now, you said you, you, you quoted good things, and you said you can go on for days. You know what, sir? I can too. Can you detail some of those quote unquote good things you were detailing? <laughs> You're looking for details here now, huh? Well, well I mean, <sighs> Interview the fans want to know what the beast is up to. Come on, give us something. I'll give you I'll just I'll give you some some tips of of, of the uh, tips of the iceberg here right now. I'm even though I may have retired from the mixed martial arts world, I am still heavily involved in it. Um, I just will no longer be the guy that's going to entertain the folks unless they bring out maybe a, a master's uh, senior division, but hopefully at that time they'll have some different rules, like, you know, no kicking the prosthetics or, uh, you know, giving you a lot more time uh, because it may take a lot more time for the two, to the two combatives to get across the, the, the cage to one another. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, I will be heavily involved in both on the amateur and the professional level, but really on the, on the professional level only trying to help uh, amateurs move on to that next level, uh, and, kind of, uh, and and you know from 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 there though my biggest impact will be on the amateur level scene because per, across the United States across the world on a pro level the unified rules are recognized but not on the amateur level and I don't think that an amateur should be competing by the unified rules in the first place just because. Uh, well, again, I, I've been running my own amateur MMA company for oh, since uh, I think '95, and uh, and it, it has changed. I, I used to do pro level shows, pro am cards, and then now my specialty is just all uh, amateur cards because yeah, that's that's the industry that needs the biggest help. Um, I, I've got probably the best set of rules in place. Matter of fact, several states that I work with they allow me to be my own sanctioning body because my rules are better than what they had in place. And practically any state that does have rules for the amateur level probably took them from me in the first place. Now, so, if you don't mind, I, I, I wouldn't want you to give away, you know, your master plan or anything like that, but considering you're trying to give back, you know, to the MMA community like you always have, would you mind detailing some of those rules that maybe some other states could benefit from? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, well, for, well, I just to be talk about um, most states follow, like, the uh, the unified rules. And to me, it's like when you have two two newbies, for example, two guys that they have never fought uh, before, a lot of times I, I like to, I like to uh, move over to one or the other's corner towards the end of the first round because I, I already know what's going to be said, but I just... I always try to see if, if something new comes along. So as 
I get towards the corner and the round comes to an end, I will see, you know, the two athletes that will be walking back to the corner and the corner guys are, are coming into the cage and stuff like this. And the athlete, uh, his eyes will be wide like a, like a deer caught in headlights. And he'll be looking at his corner guys and he'll say something to the tune of, he hit me. And, and, and but, 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 but no, no, but, but see, it's the first time that that athlete was hit for real. Mm. All this time that he's again, well, I'm talking about a newbie, a guy that's oh no, he's out there, he's been training in his training uh, facility. But uh, when you're training, you're not going 100. percent There's just no way. Matter of fact, that's one of the biggest downfalls that I see on the pro level. When you see all these cards that they continue to change because the guy got hurt here, a guy got hurt there. And reality is, it, it's not really a reflection upon the athlete. It's the reflection upon the coach that is putting that training camp together. There is no way you can train at 100% and, and still have workout partners left. That's your workout partners sooner or later. No one wants to be a punching bag for, for anybody because you're still a human being. Yeah. Retaliation will always take place as well. You have to learn how to play nice, how to use percentiles, mm-hmm. how to know that you can you can grapple at 100% and you have to do simulated type striking. I mean, there's so many things that's like, uh, well, again, I, I can bounce all over. I actually wish that they would bring me on the Ultimate Fighter show just once. I I watch it just periodically. I just don't watch. I don't watch very much television at all. Period. I watch it every now periodically, usually when I'm on the road, to see, am I seeing anything new that is being shown? And to me, it's not. It's not. It's like cookie-cutter clones of each other. Right. Same guy. I mean, same technique, different guy. Right. And I'm like, there are stuff that, that this old guy here could show that would boggle the MMA world on both a pro level and on an average level that are still not being done. And I, and I would not, I did not share any of this stuff as being a competitor because I'm thinking if these athletes and these trainers are that stupid that they can't figure out something as simple as what I'm doing here right now. But, but my, all the techniques and tactics that I do are not very visible to the naked eye. And that's where it, it's, you know, I'll say that it's not very fan friendly. I have been in matches and have been in some nice close quarter type of combatives and all of a sudden my opponent is tapping out. And I'll have some dude half a dozen rows up in the bleachers who's drinking his beer, gets angry, throws his beer down, and he starts questioning the testicular fortitude of my opponent. Now, if there was any way that you could have hooked pain electrodes from my opponent to that dude sitting half a dozen rows up in those bleachers, he would have been he would have been saying something like, Man he goes, Dude, you're the man. He goes he goes, I crap my pants, I spilled beer all over myself. He goes, he goes, You're the man. He goes, I just can't believe the count the, the amount of pain that you can throw onto somebody and I never saw it. But I I'm I'm a master I'm a master grappler, but I understand principles of leverage and I know how to use my body and my mechanics. I mean, how else, Adam, can you explain how a guy who started a cage fighting career back in 1994, just before turning 37 years of age? That's when I started. Yeah. No, no one starts at that age. They have retired. And yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, again, I'm. I'm I'm in a category all by myself, and for, for these reasons, I started at that age, and you look, I had basically a 20-year career, hmm. and there's only four people in the world that have over 100 mixed martial arts matches. I'm one of the four. There's only three in the world that have over 100 victories. I'm one of the three. Now, the ir- ironic part is, I did face the other three, I defeated the other three, and the closest one to my age is 15 years my junior. Wow. I'm, I'm, no, I'm, not, I'm not done. I'm on my soapbox here, my friend. I'm, <laughs> li- I'm lifetime chemical free. You find another pro heavyweight that can make that claim. And here's the real kicker. To have done all that I have done, the success ratio, I have probably one of the highest winning percentiles of anyone. Here's the real kicker. 
I've only done two training camps in all those years. Two. Two. Once, once for 32 days, once for 35. The guy today knows who his opponent is, I don't know, probably six and eight months out. They do these training camps, the long intensive type, type of training camps. I did too. And the rest of the times, I just walked out and taught classes. Half the time when I'm inside the cage, I'm finding out who my opponent is. Because, again, your listeners, they understand what mixed martial arts is. But I hate to say this about the United States. The United States, in a lot of ways, is so illiterate and so unknowledgeable about their history. I want any other foreigner will tell you more about the United States than what an American can tell about their own country. But that's, that's just the sheer fact of it. Hmm. And... Uh, you know, they don't understand that the, the, the predecessor to mixed martial arts was this thing called NHB, No Holes Barred. Yeah. The product today, mixed martial arts, has approximately 37 rules. Part of those 37 rules, there's weight classes, there's time periods, you fight one opponent in a given night. Back in the No Holds Barred days, there were only two rules. That being, do not bite your opponent, do not stick fingers in their eye socket. No eye gouging. Those were the only two rules. The only two. Let your imagination go wild. Anything else you could possibly come up with, Adam, you were good to go. There were no weight classes. There were no time periods. It was bare knuckled, and it was an eight-man tournament. You had to face and defeat three opponents in the same two-hour pay-per-view that is that is presented today as what was presented for the Nohos Bard era. And I am the only Triple Crown champion from that Nohos time period. And now since it's against the law to do, I'm it. Now following on that, like you said, being over 100 fights, uh, 127 professional fights, am I correct? Um, I'll say no. you got to realize... There's there's a minimum, uh, you know, conservatively, I'd say if you added another 15 to 25, you're probably you're probably in the ballpark then. Only reason I say that is, when did all of these websites that followed mixed martial arts or cage fighting or no holes barred in the first place, when did they exist? They didn't exist until two, three, four years after the fact, and then they only went back and they they followed. One company, the Ultimate Fighting Championships, right. when No Holds Barred broke ground. I mean, I, after I did my my very first one, I'd have guys say, "Here, here's the pager." Now, I hate to say this because it's another history lesson. Most people today don't even know what a pager is. A pager, a little electronic device, beeps and has a phone number. You go to a payphone, which again, another explanation. You have to. No, no, no one knows what a payphone is nowadays. You make a phone call, and uh, you're told there will be a ticket waiting for you uh, at this airport. You fly in. Uh, you will be picking up. You'll be picked up. You'll be taken out to this designation where this uh, this big tent will be set up. Uh, there's going to be a big party festivities, and you will be providing the entertainment. Now, like I said, on top of that, over a hundred fights. A lot of people, and you said you started at 37, where a lot of people would be retiring. How are you able to maintain the physical health and tenacity to keep up going in the later years? I mean, you just recently retired from mixed martial arts. How are you able to maintain? Um, well, I'll, I'll say <clears throat> I, 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 I'll, I have to bring a couple of different factors into that. First off, I never forgot, forgot what was my strengths and my attributes, that being my wrestling background. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been credited as being the guy to unleash the, the floodgates of hordes of wrestlers that have now have invaded the sport of mixed martial arts. Amateur wrestlers don't have a true profession to move on to, like football players, basketball players, baseball, hockey, things of that nature. So a lot of wrestlers look upon mixed martial arts as their professional level. There are even some high school graduates now that are opting instead of going to college to dedicate the next three, four years of their life to see what they can materialize as a uh, you know, mixed martial artist. And if it doesn't pan out, well, then they go to plan plan B, which is you know, get their education and, and to uh, go into something else. But uh, I never forgot what was my strength. Um, and I used it very, very well to my ability. I, I was never a strong striker, uh, but... 
in order for someone to strike me, they had to be within either leg and or arm distance. And right. if they got within that reach, I either could move back and stay out of the range or I would close the distance uh, so quickly that they would never be able to get a shot off. And the tenacity that I had was that my opponent will never see the light of day again unless I decide to cut them loose. I was very, again, master rapper, I was very good utilizing my strength. Now, let's go back from the beginning, before your mixed martial arts career. You credit your launch into MMA by losing the Olympic trials to a man by the name of Lou Bannock, correct? Well, I, I don't say that. That uh, <laughs> No, I, I would have retired from athletics altogether in 1984. Right. Had everything gone the way they were supposed to, but uh, I continued on. Um, I'll always, I have I have a chapter in my book that it, it's not out yet, but it, eventually it will. Hopefully, towards the end of uh, 2015 is where I'm looking at it. Uh, that chapter is simply entitled "Hate." It can consume you and destroy you, or it can, can compel you onto heights you never imagined. And I, I took the, the the latter of the two, but for almost a two year period of time. Uh, Adam, how do I put this? I had some issues okay. because I was screwed over and because it was so close and I had to rely upon the human element of referee and judges. And, uh, I mean, I still have those those old VHS tapes. And any referee that I've ever shown them to, I go, just score this match. And I go, I go just look at it and just score this match. Everyone that has scored the match said that I won and and that's where it's like, so just, just fast forwarding, I, I'll just say that losing that match, you, we would not be having this conversation today. Right, I would, following on that, you said that, you know, initially you were going to retire with, you know, after that match. You know, yeah. it, you know, the things didn't go to plan, like you said. Do you have any regrets, you know, with how everything went? I mean, you're a pioneer of mixed martial arts, a USB Hall of Famer, you know, the first Triple Crown champion. I mean, you've accomplished a lot more other than, you know, the Olympics. I mean, do you have any regrets going back? You know, how would you have panned it out, you know, hindsight 2020 now? Well, no, I mean, can I, do I have any regrets? No, I mean, it's, uh, I'm just one of those, I am one of those kind of uh, individuals that uh, I'm, I'm used to adversity and uh, overcoming adversity. You know, even being an amateur wrestler, I had to overcome adversity there. I, I was not always have success at things. It's just through that hard work and due diligence and going back again and again and again, you know, taking in more camps and clinics to learn more techniques and tactics and things of, of that nature. So, no, it, uh, uh, Jeff Blatnick, actually, um, and UFC number five, mm -hmm. uh, he, he's one of the uh, commentators, and uh, he made uh, – he made a few comments there to me. He goes, he goes uh, Dan, he goes, I was with you in 1984. He goes, I know what you went through. He goes, did you ever imagine that by 1994 uh, you know, that you would be at the top of the, the world in this uh, no holds barred arena? And only he and I knew what we were talking about. Right. So it was, uh, you know, and obviously I just simply answered, nope, I would have never imagined it because, you know, I, I didn't have my magical crystal ball there to foresee the future. It's even like right now when I tell you that I have all kinds of things. I, I mean, literally, Adam, I have 10 items on my plate right now that will be life-altering for myself and it's going to affect different industries. And those are just, and, 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 and again, that has nothing to do with the submission grappling program I have at Arizona State University. It has nothing to do with the training facility I have back in Coldwater, Michigan. So I'm thinking what, what would be a full plate for most people, just the little things I do. I have 10 items on my plate right now that are going to affect a lot of people in a lot of different positive ways. So needless to say, you know, most people's full plate is your appetizer, yeah? Uh, yeah, so well, let's put it this way. Yeah, you guys, you guys, were, okay, let's just talk about this morning's uh, um, setting up for the interview. You know, if I get my text and stuff like this, I'm out in Arizona. I've, I've been traveling. I've been on the East Coast, West Coast, Midwest. 
uh, quite a bit just in the, in, the, in the past 30 days. And in the, the next two months, I will be all over the place. I like doing my little Facebook postings because people just they can't keep track up with me. And they, they, they keep wondering, when are you going to slow down? When are you going to retire? And I'm thinking, not until they throw dirt on me. I like what I do. I really do like what I do. It. And, and I, I swear, as the day goes on, I don't get weaker. I get stronger. Yeah. I I only wish I had another half a dozen of me, just younger models. I could keep them all busy, throw stashes on them all, and keep keep them busy. Now let's touch on the the family side of things real quick. You have a son who is a state uh, state wrestling champion, correct? Uh, five uh, five children, uh, and they're they're all wrestling champions. Well, okay, I, I have two daughters, so no, I, I, I it's uh no, I have, I have five children, but I. I I kept them naive of a lot of what I did. Uh, the only thing that I would say that where they became much more knowledgeable what is the social medias, and I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I, I, I look at I look upon social media as both good and bad. And I talk to a lot of young people now about you know that be be aware of the social medias because at one moment of indiscretion, a lifetime on the Internet. Yeah. So, but with that said, all of my kids were all, all involved in different types of athletics. I really only had uh, one son that followed me really in my footsteps of being a wrestler. I mean, he was a football player, a wrestler. I, I played three sports in high school between football, wrestling, and uh, track and field in, in the spring. If it wasn't for athletics, I it would have been tough to ke- have kept me in school in the first place because I was not exactly um, the kind of guy that that, that enjoyed uh, doing uh, book type work. Right. Now, does your son, that is the wrestling champion, everything like that, that, does he have aspirations to fill his father's, you know, enormous shoes to fill? Uh, no, no. As a matter of fact, I'm I'm actually the, the one that. Uh, probably uh, have swayed him to go other routes. Just because it's, uh, if you want to do this, well, uh, let me let me rephrase that again, Adam. Literally, if you want to do, do anything and to be really successful, the key word is sacrifice. Yeah. Um, and, and there's a lot of people, they'll, they'll never even be able to comprehend this uh, what I've had to sacrifice over the years, um, is there going to be some regrets about that? Sure, there actually there is some regrets about that because I have missed so many uh, birthdays, uh, anniversaries, uh, baby's first steps, baby's first words. It was like, you know, da- uh, and, and the, the line I always used was, you know, dad is only a phone call away. But that's not the same thing as being there. Right. At time. So, yeah, that would be the, um, probably my only regret in through that, that entire process. But like I said, there was just the way that um, cards were dealt to me at the time. Um, you know, again, you what you talked about there um, earlier, I, I have to back up a little bit. You talked about 1984. I had already, I had already moved on from that, that time period. Really what launched my career um, you know, kind of a sad story, uh, just to get the you know the Reader's Digest uh, version of it all. I had coached both at Arizona State, Michigan State. Um, I left the the coaching ranks to put my uh, degree to work, and I was uh, I was working uh, living in in, in Owasso, Michigan, and working in Albion, Michigan, which was an 82 mile commute one way. So that's, again, I wasn't going to uproot my family unless I knew the job was going to work out. Well, I was there for about a year. I mean, it was like uh, I I basically saved the company. Uh, I worked in uh, quality control, so instrumentation, reading, you know, being able to read all these micrometers and things of that nature. So uh, the guy who hired me saw what good things I did. He went out to bigger and better things down in Coldwater, Michigan. Mm -hmm. And now he's offered me the same basic job but better money, Profit sharing, all the bells, buzzers, and whistles, and, and uh, you know, I'm looking at my age and thinking, okay, got to you know, give 20 years of my life to the corporation, retire with Gold Watch, blah blah blah. 
And I said, well, how much time do I have? He goes, two weeks. Adam, in two weeks, I sold a home. I bought a home. I went to work, and I did not have a job. Huh. So, again, there's a whole lot more to it than that, but all I know is that I took a bad situation and I turned it into a good situation. Um, I had been approached by several uh, independent professional wrestling companies through the 80s, and and I didn't want to turn pro at that time because had I turned pro, I would have lost my amateur status, and my amateur wrestling career meant more to me than anything else. You know, I, you know the, the, the utopia of an of an amateur wrestler is being a world champion, being an Olympic champion. You know, those are just just the goals. And um, so, uh, I this was all around 1992 that this all happened. Well, as of the 1992 Olympics, a new rule came down from the United States Olympic Committee, the committee that allowed athletes to be both amateur and professional simultaneously. That's when you saw the dream teams and basketball, stuff like this, that were coming on out. Well, it gave me my carte blanche aspect as well. I started doing professional wrestling. I used my real name. I real, used my real amateur credentials. And I happened to be, I mean, literally, I was so aggressive after my professional wrestling, you know, to only train for just maybe probably a couple months, and now I'm doing matches. And uh, there had to be a guy from Nashville, Tennessee, and he says, uh, he goes, is, that, is those credentials legit? And I go, well, yes. He says, you ought to be over in Japan doing this thing called shoot fighting or shoot wrestling. Never heard of it before. I gave him a business card, athletic resume. Three days later, I get a phone call. Ten days later, I'm in Nashville, Tennessee for a trial. Thirty days later, I'm in Tokyo, Japan in front of 12,000 people. Did not have a clue as to what I'm doing. All I know is my Asian opponent kicked me half a dozen times really, really hard. And I think I'm not about to be teed off on it like this. I closed the distance. I grabbed him. And I did, I did this aerodynamic uh, tossing all over the place, dismantling my opponent, much to the crowd's um, appreciation. And then in the Japanese interpreter, he's like, a Don Saban, you, it will become a superstar in Japan. I'm thinking, I don't know about that superstar thing, but I'm going to protect myself. And then, uh, you know, a tough man, a tough man. Of, I, I saw a tough man flyer. I never, I never balled up my fist to my fellow man in my entire life. But first prize was a thousand bucks. Adam, I needed a thousand bucks to keep the roof over the head and to keep food on the table for my family. You know the old, the old cliche, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. Well, I, I kind of rephrased it a little bit. You know, necessity was the father of invention. I was the father. I had to take care of my family. Yeah. So, I, I, I tell people is I climbed into a ring that night. And uh, two days, because usually they, they used to always run a Friday, Saturday. I'll say two days, seven minutes later, I walked out of uh, that ring with a thousand dollars and uh, newfound skills. I, I found out that I wasn't half bad at this fighting thing. <laughs> now, as we've said, I mean that's an amazing story there. I mean, definitely inspirational. You had many accolades in your pro career outside of being a fighter, wrestler, and so forth. What did you find as your vice, you know, what you did for you for fun while not training or fighting? What were some of the hobbies outside of the arena? <laughs> this, this, uh, wow. This could be showing the Achilles uh, heel here of, of the beast or now. Um, <laughs> I grew up on a farm. Okay. So, uh, you, know, if, uh, you know, not a big farm, 120 acres, and it's a combination of crops and animals. So uh, on, on the property that I have in Coldwater, Michigan, I'm still a big believer that your your property should produce something. So uh, hobbies, I put in a garden. <laughs> this, this is going to be really bad here, Adam. I put in a garden every year. I have a nice fruit orchard of 20, I think about 21 trees, a whole variety of cherry trees and uh, all types of species of apple trees and uh, pears and things of nature. I have a small grape arbor on top of that, so grapes and things of that nature. Um, I, and right now I'm in the process of looking to get a beehive put on there just for, for pollination type process. Um, <laughs> what else do I go into? I mean, literally, I'm, uh, I enjoy being outdoors. 
I'm the guy that uh, late, uh, way early in the spring, which I mean is uh, probably in the month of March, I'm uh, I'm pruning all my fruit trees and stuff like this as well. I'm, uh, you know, I have a 10,000 square foot training facility on, my, on that same piece of property as well, which sounds well, really impressive, but it was just a storage facility. At the time, I could have never have afforded a residence and a business simultaneously, but the house is just an old farmhouse. But what I fell in love with is on the, on the same property, there's, there was this old hip roof barn and then this storage facility of 10,000 square feet. And I'm thinking, I, you know, you had to really squint your eyes and, and uh, you know, might have uh, been uh, done better, uh, better yet had you had a couple shots of who knows what to, to see, to realize the dream of this. But I knew that. I knew what I could do with this property, but I wasn't looking at it as a fighter at that time. I was my first love was still amateur wrestling. I simply knew that I could develop a training facility and be doing summer camps and uh, be able to teach classes in the evenings uh, of my first love, amateur wrestling. So, but now it's morphed into so much more because professional wrestling is being taught there, uh, amateur wrestling, mixed martial arts. Boxing, kickboxing, you know, just as long as I have the instructor, I've got, I've got the facilities, I can do whatever I want. So we know you, you're very involved still with MMA and everything, but talking about the farms and everything like that, when can we expect, you know, the beast produce to come out or maybe with the grapes of wine to come out? Well, you know, I, um, those are some of the things I actually am working on. Really? Yeah, I mean, you, 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 you might have thought you were pulling a little funny type of thing there, Adam, but uh, you would be surprised some of the things that I have. And, 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 again, those are not even in my top ten. Yeah. But those are just little things. But it's even – I'm really big into solar and things of these natures. It's kind of like I'm, I'm in the process of trying to work with a few local groups to say, let's come on board here, let's put some, some solar panels on top of, the, of this barn, and let's start to show – uh, what types of things could be done with alternative energy usage? Yeah, I like, yeah, I mean, that's one aspect. But then putting in a, uh, a a windmill on top of that again as as another, so that you know, I, I, my what I envision my property to be, it, 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 I'll never be done with it. It will it'll be the ongoing, you know, like the never ending story. It'll, it'll always be going on because I know what I I want it. I envision what it will be one day. It'll be there's uh, like another thirty acres that's for sale behind me, and it's uh, uh, it's wooded things of nature, and it's I mean, real estate in Michigan is pretty inexpensive, so I'm actually looking at acquiring more property, and I will have you know jogging trails, obstacle courses, uh, soccer fields, things of that nature. It'll be an entire complex compound, and uh, of just uh, you know maybe bringing inner city kids. And bring them out there to where it might be a combination of, uh, of not only a training facility, but then also uh, for alternative energy. Uh, maybe the alternative energy will help to uh, power some of the things. I mean, there's, there's so many things that I envision of doing there um, that, uh, again, it just, I'll, I'll be, I, what I envision is somewhere way down the road, uh, there'll be some young kids running the, uh, across, uh, you know, the part of this this, this uh, property, and I'll yell at the, at the kids, hey, you kids, I'll, I'll, I'll grovel at them, stuff like this, and they'll they'll turn to each other, they'll say, well, who's that? And his, the other, his my friend will look right back into him, and he'll say, well, word has it, he used to be somebody. And that's, that's, that's how I envision myself. <laughs> of course, I'm hoping that that's, I'll be about 125 at that time. No, well, it's never. You're never not going to be a somebody. Your name's always going to be secured in a legacy, and you know, in the mixed martial arts like. But like you said, you're talking about having you know people on the farm and, and growing. You know, what advice could you give to upcoming and aspiring wrestlers and MMA fighters? You know, not many people have the miles that you have and experience to give better advice than what the beast can. Um, I'm I'm really big about saying make sure that you always have plan B, C, and D right along. Plan A, again, if you're, if you're a cage fighter, plan A is you're going to go out there, you're going to destroy your opponent, and you'll become this champion. I hate to tell these young fighters, but that's also the plan that your opponent has. Someone's plan is about to be, get destroyed here. So always have plan B, C, and D going. I, I'm, I'm really big about education, even though I have to tell people, do as I 
say and not as I did. I say that, but at the same token, Adam, I did have a good GPA in high school. Uh, you know, my grades and, and uh, my athletic prowess uh, as both a football player and as a wrestler, I had probably just as many football scholarships offered to me as I did amateur wrestling scholarships. I chose wrestling because I, I was so frustrated with football that I did not have 10 other players playing with the same enthusiasm that I had. And what I liked about wrestling was the definition of wrestling, a team sport based upon individual performances. The team can lose, and I can still win. And I like that, and that's what I think I like about stuff like track and field. Again, you know, most times it's those individual performances unless you're on a real IT team. And then, uh, you know, and I think that's what uh, I've kind of inspired to, to a lot of my kids that you can only, you know, because, for example, I have one young, uh, one late in life young son. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's uh, a freshman in high school. Okay. And uh, yeah, I have to tell him all the time when we when he talks about you know because he's, he's a, uh, his football season just came to an end, and, and then he'll say, well, uh, you know, ask him how did their team do, and he goes, well, we lost. I go, well, how did you do? And then he'll tell me, okay, to go. So I said, you 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 did great. I said, don't take it bad that your team lost. I go, as long as you did your job, don't feel bad. Hold your head up and be proud of what you did. You can't if someone is. Uh, lazy and misses the block, misses the tackle. Um, I mean, that's and again, that's why I say that's why I did not like you know, and and I don't like it when I hear all these coaches say, "Give me 110 percent, give me 150 percent." There is no such thing. Obviously, these are gentlemen and women that don't know much about math. I I say that there's only there's 100 percent, and then there's 101. Mm-hmm. When you have gone beyond your body's capacity, and that's only 101%. And it's, uh, yeah, I've been in, in matches before where I, I'm just, it's almost like I'm, I'm, I'm uh, everything goes into slow mo- uh, motion to where literally I, I went into a whole different plane to where I literally, I see everything coming. And I know everything that I'm about to do. And it's kind of like, that's kind of a utopia, euphoria that uh, very few people will ever experience. But I've been in cage fights, same thing. And, and and that's what I'll, I'll say that for doing all the stuff I've done and just the cage fighting scene, people, you know, they ask me, well, well, how how did you survive so well just like you did earlier? I never forgot where I came from, but I, I look at probably the one tool I have that I will say that, that is way over most of my opponents is my mind, my ability to think and react and do. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I mean, honestly, I honestly hate to say this, Adam, I uh, I think I could probably still go out and and, and uh, go for another uh, another couple of years doing that. I mean, I could come back out of retirement and go for another couple of years. As a matter of fact, as a comedic type of thing, I kept thinking I could do this thing called I, I'd call it the turd tour. <laughs> that uh, I would do 52 matches in uh, one year, one, one one a week. But I, I would be doing I'd be going off these small independent uh, professional level MMA things because there are so many guys that they think they're all that, but they're not. Right. And I would just wear out a shirt and I'd just have their number. You're next and I'd have number, you know, uh, whatever, number 21, number 33, number 45. But I, 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 I know I could do 52 matches in one year and I would win all 52 matches just because no. there's so many guys that are out there that just because – you can win the local Yoko MMA uh, show. Mm-hmm. That's cool if that's what your aspirations. But uh, if you really think that you have any, any true attributes to move on to that next level, you're uh, you're fooling yourself. Now, following on that, do you have any aspirations to actually accomplish that and get it done? Uh, you know, that would be, you know, I don't know. It, it's I, again. I, I have a very creative mind on, on different type of aspects there as well of what's uh, 
uh, what can be done. You know, I, I don't know. It's, that's something that's in the back of my mind. And to me, I look at it this way. Even though uh, I'm, I'm 56, um, it's kind of like I know that I could still probably do this even in, within the next couple of years' time frame if I don't do it right now. That's that again. That's how confident I am. Right. And also, uh, practically, you know, a couple times a month, I'm, I'm doing appearances at various MMA shows, and I'm seeing what is out there on the pro scene, and I'm, I'm thinking, you really, wow. <laughs> They could, I could go out there with one arm tied behind my back and still do just and, and do better than what, what some of these guys are doing. <laughs> now, following on that, your career is flooded with accolades, you know, from Arizona State Wrestling Hall of Famer. You were a coach there. You headlined and won the WC1 event, UFC Hall of Famer, Triple Crown. It goes on and on. You're pro wrestling. With all of that said, can you detail the highlight of your professional career? The one single point that stands out the most to you? No. <laughs> That's really the it's just that simple no. I mean, it's, uh, I've I've been trying to come up with different titles for my uh, book and stuff like this, and uh, one of the titles I, I, I thought of, but I, I, I probably won't go with, uh, is called Moments in Time. Um, just because I have, during my amateur career, I have had moments in time that really have stood out over and above anything else. Uh, in my uh, my professional wrestling career, moments of time. My my cage fighting career, moments of time. Now, again, if I just to touch on say, because you're, you're you're all about the the cage fight type stuff. So the utopia of my career um, would be the event called the Ultimate Ultimate, held back in '96. Uh, it was the first time that the Ultimate Fighting Championship brought back various champions, eight man tournament. They were either champions and or runner-ups. Uh, so it was an eight-man tournament format. They put out the largest monetary reward at that point in time, I think, which was $150,000. And uh, it was the first time you actually knew who your first opponent would be. Again, that's what, again, you know, the education is like, you know, you did, back when it was the Noah's Bard, there would be a Friday night not weigh-in because there were no weight classes. Right. You had a Friday night press conference where you got a chance to meet the eight individuals. Mm-hmm. And during that press conference, they pulled out basically a bingo ball machine. There would be eight balls in there with names on them. And as uh, wrote the first ball that would come out, there that's number one. Second ball come out, there's number two. First match is made. The night before, less than 24 hours later, you'd be in a cage fighting that person. And you know nothing about that person. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like a whole different era than when you look at today. You could study all kinds of stuff just by Googling the name and, and uh, seeing matches, uh, see all kinds of, of, of how they react and things of that nature. So it's, uh, again, it's just a whole different era. I don't even remember what uh, what was the original question you asked me before I went off into yet a different little tangent there. Oh no, I was just saying, what, what can you detail the highlight of your professional career? Yeah, said, okay, no. so the ultimate, ultimate, uh, out of a two-hour pay-per-view between the three opponents that I had, I was inside that octagon cage just over one hour, and that was in Denver, Colorado. Mile high elevation. Now that was my second training camp. Mm-hmm. I did one for UFC number five, and I did one for the Ultimate Ultimate. Now, and that's why I was prepared to do whatever I had to do at that point in time. Right. Now, like you said, back you know back in those days, you didn't know who you were fighting. You couldn't really research them. You just got who you got. Is that an extra intimidation factor? I mean, like you said today. A lot of these fighters, they can YouTube, they can Google, they can they have a, a bunch of utilities to where they can search out their opponents. Was that in a little intimidation factor of, you know what, I have no idea who this person is? No, no. I mean, uh, not for me. Um, and the reason I'll say that is that uh, my amateur wrestling uh, pedigree helped me out a great deal. Um, even still to this day, I will say that, 
uh, well, for first of all, I'll make a couple of different claims. I have been hurt far worse in my amateur wrestling career than in my cage fighting career. Now, ironic part of this is I've been hurt really far worse in my professional wrestling career than I have been in all three careers. Really? Which is almost like a contradiction in terms because how is that possible when one is real and one is in the world of fantasy? Yeah. I, I hope I'm not bursting anyone's uh, bubble here today. Uh, I don't want them to be running home and crying in their John Cena or their Hulk Hogan doll or something like that. But, you know, professional wrestling is that world of fantasy. Uh, but, I mean, uh, it is, you know, I, I don't like to hear the word fake because what these athletes are doing, I mean, you know, to me, the professional wrestlers are some of the most incredible athletes doing some of the most incredible athletic maneuvers without the aid of a safety net. Now, it's a choreographed mm-hmm. dance, yeah. and but these, these wrestlers are taking a great deal of trauma and blunt force to their body. To be, pick, to be picked up a body slam, it, it just doesn't feel good, I mean, especially when you realize that what, what they're landing on. Um, and that's, uh, well, my whole point here now, okay, the differences on, on this. Uh, and a, why I say that I've been hurt far worse in my professional wrestling than, than my cage fight career, in a cage match, all I had to do was go out there and get results. Whether that match lasted five seconds or five minutes or 50 minutes, just getting in results. Mm-hmm. Now, in professional wrestling, you have a promoter that will simply say that, hey, uh, Adam and Dan, you guys need to put on a 10-minute match. Adam, you get to win. Win by cheating, so makes so Dan still looks strong, so he can come back uh, down the road, blah, 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 that kind of stuff. So you guys put together the match. So in professional wrestling, it's a game of give and take. Right. So I have to put – you have to, and, and the number one number one rule of professional wrestling is I protect you and you protect me. But, you know, there's so many of these people in that industry that I swear do not have two – brain cells that bang together in the first place. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's where I said I, I've been hurt far worse because I have had to put my body into someone else's hands and they did not know how to do a move correctly or I was too heavy for them or they had baby oil on them and now all of a sudden you slide a little bit further south so when they go to do a tombstone instead of, you know, him laying on his knees, he, he, he power drives right on the top of your head. So. Yeah. That's why I said that I've been hurt worse in that industry than any other industry. Gotcha. And amateur wrestling would be number two, and cage fighting, <laughs> last on the list, <laughs> Which <laughs> would be it would be number one. But again, that's in in my career. Right. Now, if you don't mind, let's let's take a blast from the past to the Hoist Grace fight. You you fought a who's who list of you know many professional fighters, essentially everybody and all the pioneers. You know, both of you and Hoist are pioneers and led mixed martial arts to, the, to where it is today. What, if anything, would you change about that contest, and how do you think you fare against Hoist today? You say you're healthy and you're ready to go, but both retired MMA fighters, you know, coming from the old school days, what would you change, and how do you think you'd fare today? Well, I mean, that, that uh, I was at the 20-year anniversary of the uh, Ultimate Fighting Championships, and there was four of us that was up on the panel, Hoist, and uh, Mark Coleman, and uh, boy, uh, uh, Jamerson, uh, Art Jamerson, and myself. And uh, it was it was interesting because, I mean, there was a couple thousand people in this little arena, and they had two microphones, and people were coming up and asking questions left and right. And it was, it was uh, you know, really kind of intrigued. So as, as these questions are being asked, mm-hmm. um, it was, there, there was a, oh, I'll say this, sort of a, an arrogance. Uh, that was coming from Hoist that kind of bothered me. Really? And uh, and I kept thinking, well, again, I, I've been asked this question probably, you know, uh, I'll say hundreds of times right. over the years. And and I guess, uh, you know, my, my answer has always basically been the same, you know, maybe uh, – Described a little bit differently, I tell people that yeah, I tapped, um, but I there's only one person will know what went down in that match, and that's me. 
Okay. Uh, when I was told I was in UFC number four, I've always been a busy person uh, in my entire life. And uh, I had a number of things I had to fulfill. I wouldn't fulfill my obligations. I, I basically, out of my train for five days. Right. An hour and a half a day inside of a professional wrestling ring. You got to realize cages were, were not dominant like they are today. Right. I, I, I think I think you could almost probably go into almost any community and you will find a cage somewhere because some uh, training facility is, is saying that we train mixed martial arts. Yeah. And uh, so I, I trained in. in uh, I drove an hour and a half away to Lyme, Ohio, basically to, to, to train for an hour and a half. Well, again, I probably would have, would have went longer, but I had three workout partners, and they were spent in an hour and a half's time. Mm -hmm. They had one old pair of boxing gloves between them, and uh, they would do a rotation. And one guy would come in, and he'd be trying to punch, kick, and do whatever types of uh, primitive submissions that they could come up with. And just like I said before to you, uh, I either kept my distance or moved in, clinching it. I used my, my amateur wrestling skills quite well, and I simply would take them down. I would slap on an amateur wrestling move, turn it slightly illegal, make them scream or squawk, and that was my training camp. I did not train a single legitimate uh, submission. I did not train a single strike. When I showed up to the... UFC uh, 4, I was asked, well, what's my martial arts discipline? And I simply said, I'm an American wrestler. Uh -huh. And they looked at me and they said, well, what's that going to do for you? And I, I go, just watch me. <laughs> Literally, I've been, uh, Mike Chapman is probably one of the biggest uh, writers on the sport of, of amateur wrestling. I think he, Mike has probably produced 30-some-odd books over the years. I've gotten the chance to know Mike quite well since the mid-70s and on. And he credits me for, in one night, turning amateur wrestling into a martial art. Uh, nobody yeah, at that point in time, my very first match was going against, going against Anthony Macias. No one had ever seen one man bodily pick up another man and then launch him on his head. But again, that was a Greco-Roman wrestling technique. So I, when I went out there, I just used either my Greco-Roman wrestling, my freestyle wrestling, my folk style wrestling to the best of my ability. And even when you look at UFC number four, I did not strike anybody. In my, my, excuse me. My first two matches, I didn't strike either one of those opponents. I did what I did. Now, in my match three against Hoist, you know, uh, again, I, I took him down. I, I felt comfortable with where I was at. Uh, but I'm realizing what primitive submissions I knew were not exactly working on him. Mm. And I'm thinking to myself, I, I think I'm going to have to hit this guy. Yeah. But, and I always tell people, I I was more torn with my conscience than anything else. Because at that point in time, I was an amateur wrestler of 26 years. Yeah. 26 years of rules, regulations, sportsmanlike conduct that had, had been instilled into me and, and you know you, you can't strike people so I always tell people that I struggled more with my conscience than I ever did with an opponent and when I did start to throw a strike it was all peripheral a little bit off the side here oh well, okay well let's see well, maybe this one will hurt him a little bit more Boop. and uh, it just it's uh, through the course of that match yeah, I'm a big believer that eyes are the window to an individual soul I'm staring right to his soul Mm -hmm. he's looking over at his dad outside the cage. Yeah. And I can read exactly what's going through his mind. It's like, Dad, I'm hanging in here, but if you were to throw that towel in, I wouldn't hold against you. And I, my eyes go from hoises, I look right over at Helio outside the cage. Helio's got the towel in his hand. He brings up, crosses his arm, and he shakes his head, no. And I'm thinking to myself, you old bastard. <laughs> you, let, you let me kill your kid out here for, you know, Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. Well, right. nobody knows that Dan Severn is out there. Again, I, I told, I I have never told any of my family members whenever I had a match. I was a professional wrestler. I would just tell my family, oh, I've got another, got another raffle match to go off and do. 
So it wasn't 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 a real lie. It was in that little white category of lies where it's like, well, to me, it was a wrestle match because that was my greatest skill. I was going to be utilizing out there. But like I said, social media has kind of exposed that, and to where you know, you know, cell phones are all over the place. You you can hardly leave an arena. Yeah, be you could be inside of a cage, finish up your match, and people in the audience will have recorded it and posted it and put it out on the internet before you ever left that cage. Right. That's how quickly it's being posted now. Yeah. So again I just you know, to sum up what you asked me there the only the only regret I have about that match is knowing if I could have done what I know I'm capable of doing. And I only ever have gone into uh, one match with evil intent, and that was when I had a match against Tank Abbott. After what I saw, what he did to people, I'm thinking, hmm, this is someone that will hurt you and then mock you yeah. afterwards. And I simply said, well, evil will be got a greater evil that night. Because, I mean, it's... I'm I'm known as one of the nicest guys in the industry, but at the same token, I can turn it on like nobody else can. Absolutely. And that's where I always say the ring name, The Beast, came from the legendary football player, Jim Brown. He was one of the play-by-play commentators for several of the UFCs. And in the beginning, you would meet with him and Jeff Latnick, and they would ask you various questions so that they had some filler material to talk about when mm-hmm. matches go. And the first time he met me, he even made the comment. He says he didn't take much of me because he says, I wore glasses, meek, mild man. He goes, he goes, he says, you kind of reminded me of Superman, how Clark Kent, take your glasses off, dun, dun, dun. He goes, he goes, how do you turn it on like that? And I'm thinking, Jim Brown is asking me a question like this. But then in his closing comments, from UFC 4 to UFC 5, he said when Dan Seven first came on the scene, he was just a wrestler. He was so technical. He was so clinical. He is now so aggressive. Uh, he's like an animal. He's like a beast. Right. So I always tell people that Dan the Pussycat Seven doesn't sell tickets, but Dan the Beast Seven does. <laughs> and, uh, and anyone that knows me knows what a positive individual I am. And the, the the ring name the Beast has a lot of negative connotations. So I I'm a, I'm a pretty good spin master. I took a negative and I spun it into a positive. The word the stands for Dan Severn. I'm a teacher, humanitarian, and I'm an educator. And my message to young people is Beast: to believe in yourself, to educate yourself, to adjust your everyday attitude to study hard, and then to teach others. So I took a negative and spun it to a positive because, I mean, literally, you know, Adam, my entire life is, is uh, I've been a teacher and a, and a giver my entire life. I started I started the sport of amateur wrestling in 1969. By 1971, I was teaching the sport of wrestling. By 72, I won my first national title. And you were born when? 1985. Yeah, and I and actually, I'm surprised. I, I would have thought for sure it was going to be in the 90s there, and I and my whole comment is simply saying that I have been terrorizing athletes for decades, plural, decades. Well, I mean, the tear started, you know, right before my time started, but uh, let's move on to another, you know, iconic figure in mixed martial arts. Between you and Ken Shamrock, you know, adapting into your fight, your, you know, your mixed martial arts fight into your pro wrestling matches around Shamrock, did it become a friendly rivalry, you know, bad blood, or was it just business and the rivalry was used as just a pitch for the show? Can you detail the relationship with you and Ken, considering you had to deal with him from professional fighting as well as professional wrestling? Well, again, um, I have never had a conversation like this. Um, so there was, you know, to me, it was it was a, a rivalry that was either created to me, it's, again, it's either created in his mind or was uh, created in the mind of the uh, UFC ownership at that point in time or others. Um, and, Adam, and I'm going back to saying that me personally, I have never been in a fight in my entire life, mm-hmm. but I have been a competitor my entire life. Then when people say, well, what what do you call this, this cage fight type stuff? I go, well... To me, that's still a competition. You know, there's 37 rules. Today, 
there were two rules before I go. I said, in a true fight, there are no rules. Right. Uh, game off. I mean, I, I, ironically, I have probably been closer in the last, say, uh, 20 years of getting into a fight than the previous 30-some years. And I say it like that because I do a lot of appearances at sports bars. It's yeah. to the point that now that I make certain it's earlier in the evening that I go and do my appearance at sports bar because later in the evening, after uh, people have partaken of too many of uh, uh, the libations, their inhibitions tend to to come out. And I, I'll, I'll bet be at some appearances and people will be like, uh, some guys will be like, I thought you'd be bigger, I thought you'd be meaner looking, or uh, you write like a girl. Cause I, and, I, and I go, is that because my spelling is legible? I mean, I, I, I ding them back, a little sparring right there, to the point that they, that they continue to push the issues and then I'll take out one of my business cards and I'll write a phone number on it and I'll hand it to them. And they're like, well, what's this? I go, I said, that's the phone number to the Ultimate Fighting Championships. Mm -hmm. And well, what's that? he goes, what's that for? And then I'm like, well, I've never fought for free. I don't plan on starting any bad habits now. I said, the cool part about this, my friend, is there's a, refer ref ref there's a referee there, and you will be no further than probably 35, 40 feet from a medical practitioner at any point in time, because if this starts here right now, my friend, there is no referee, and I no. will sleep with you when I'm finished. So, uh, my, my question is, what what kind of you know moronic person would try and pick a fight with an MMA legend, a pioneer of the sport? What kind of person would do that? One that has had one too many barley pops. Uh, That's so why I, it's that, even even Adam. after. I, Adam, I to pick that fight. Adam, you go to, on any Friday or Saturday night, you go to the local pub, <laughs> and you walk in there, and you do a quick 360, and you tell me how many UFC t-shirts, affliction ball caps that you will spot, and if you were to ask them, they'll all be saying, oh yeah, I'm training for the UFC. These guys can't spell UFC, let alone <laughs> be doing it. Let alone try and pick a fight with Dan the B. Severn. That, that that boggles my mind why somebody would ever attempt that. Well, like I said, I, I, I always tell people I've been closer in the last, you know, like I said, 20-some years than I have been in the, the previous. But, uh, you know, I've, it, nothing is like that has happened because I'm, I'm, used, I'm pretty good with my people skills. And to uh, not put myself, paint myself into a corner. Yeah. Now I got about three more questions left. Now one of them is gonna maybe maybe touch home a little bit, but if you could change anything in your career, what would it be, and how can you detail it? As well as how would you battle that change? Well, uh, and then my 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 quick short answer to that is uh, nothing, because you you can't. That's why I've been asked that question many times, and I used to ponder on it at first, but I'm thinking, well, you can't, you can't go back in time, so why even think about it? It's, uh, um, I, you should be, I, I, I will live with all my decisions. Yeah. And the only thing that that uh, that would fall into that category, what I said before, was that uh, I did sacrifice just <clears throat> way too much family time. Yeah. But. Um, as my kids get older, I think it's kind of like even with my own parents. Uh, my father, uh, my father worked a lot, mm -hmm. and again, but what I didn't realize, well, but as as I got older, the more intelligent and the more understanding I was of my father, and I'm realizing, man, the guy had eight kids. Yeah, I have seven other siblings, and I'm thinking. What he did and what he accomplished is mind-boggling. Because I always tell, you know, again, just give a little history right there, that uh, my father was the baby of 12 living children. Wow. Now, again, that sounds phenomenal in terms of, again, I still remember going to my grandparents' home, and they did not have plumbing inside the house. They had a, they had an out outhouse. 
Yeah. Uh, the plumbing that was inside the house was in what they call the mud room, where you basically, as you come in from outside, you kick off your your uh, muddy boots and stuff like this in the mud room, and uh, then you proceeded into the house. Well, in the mud room, there was a, a, an old-fashioned pump handle pump, yeah. where you 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 would fill up a bucket of water and then bring it in and put it on the stove, and you'd be heating it up. An old pot belly stove, and uh, so I mean it's you know so people. So I, when I go back and I'll just say in 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 three generations, my grandfather could not read or write. He he would make his mark with a pencil, but the man had a genius of a mind. He could put together gears and stuff like this. I mean, he was a machinist. He could put together gears, but they, he couldn't read or write. My father was the first of 12 uh, living children to uh, have gone and acquire some college classes. Mm-hmm. And now my siblings and I, uh, eight of us, we all have degrees. So I think, look at, look at that. In three generations, look what it, look what it has done. It's just my family's branch right now to go from... Uh, being illiterate to basically now having all, all people have got degrees in, in various fields. So again, that just it just shows what what can be done if it is your aspirations. Right. Now, with all of your siblings and the family ties and everything, it seems like it's a close knit family. Um, I, I didn't have, have this question uh, before, but I'm curious: Is your family very fond of your prestigious career? Like, you know, are you the stud of the family because of everything you've accomplished? And you know, what a public figure you are. Um. Uh, again, what I'll, I'll say on that is that uh, I've always played down my credentials. Okay. Uh, I'm even with my my son. My son, very accomplished for what. Uh, again, I I hate to even just say one. I, all my kids. I mean, I'm, I'm proud of all my kids in different ways. But now, like the wrestler, um, I, I can talk a little bit more about that. You know, because the, the the hard part. You know, I'm, I'm going to bounce around in different aspects of this. My oldest son, a phenomenal basketball player, a cross country, a basketball player. And, and also involved in, in track and field. Very, very gifted athlete right there. I kept thinking that uh, I, I really wanted him to go out for the decathlon because he had the ability, in my opinion, to to do well in the decathlon. Just because he could, he could run, he could jump, he could he could do it all. The bad part was he was uh, discouraged due to team sports. Yeah, and having uh, men that wielded the title of coach as God over children. And that's where I've had to have some conversation with some men that realistically there was never a conversation that needed to take place. These individuals needed to be taken out back behind the woodshed and needed to be beaten. Right. Is really what what they needed, and again, I think that's what's wrong with a lot of kids nowadays because of all this entitlement and this and that and the whole nine yards. I'm thinking, obviously, you just you just need a good old good old fashioned ass beating is what you need. <laughs> and then, there's a lot of people that will that will take that the wrong way, and that's fine. They can they can take it any way they want, but that's when corporal punishment left our school systems. Uh, it really changed the world, the United States, in a lot of in a lot of bad ways. Mm-hmm. There used to be something when you walked into uh, again. I remember walking into it would not happen during years because corporal punishment was already gone uh, when you were in school. So to walk into a school and to see a paddle hanging up on the on the blackboard, and then and, and then some of the guys, uh, some of the teachers were, were very proud that even would say, would be engraved at the board of education, and some would have holes. Drilled into it so it was aerodynamically, uh, you know, uh, 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 designed. But you only ever got out of line once. All right. And then when you got your bottom end lit up, oh, would you actually ever get out of line again? No, you wouldn't. But no. nowadays you have you have kids that will say the most god awful things to their teacher, and they'll say, "If you touch me, my parents will sue." Oh, that. They're, they're, they're so 
again, this is a whole different thing. There's so many things wrong in the United States, and yet there's no other country I'd rather live in than the United States. But it's its lack of its lack of leadership, and its lack of well, I I, I, I call it backbone and balls is what I call it. Gotcha. So, now I'm curious. Uh, you, you're talking about the school system. You know, you have kids in the school system and extracurricular activities, everything like that. I, I only had a few more questions, but I'm actually a little more curious now. I'm picturing you at, like, your kids, you know, uh, you know, basketball events, football events, everything like that. You know, if a parent gets out of line, does it ever cross your mind or maybe a coach where it's like, well, dude, I'm, I'm banned with these seven. You really might want to check yourself right now. Well, no, I mean, uh, well, when you the way that you're you're actually asking this question, you mean that fans getting out and enraged with me, or or getting enraged no, with? Just, uh, just if they talk out of line about like the game at hand, or maybe talking down to their son, or you know, talking down on the other athletes per se, or maybe well, the coach is being a little harsh. Well, no, the, the, no, there is. Uh, for example, being at, uh, I'll be at like a kids amateur wrestling event. I'll be doing an appearance there, and I'll be watching some of the competition. And what I what I don't like seeing is I'll see. And let's give you an idea. In, in the, across the United States, most uh, kids can start wrestling competitively at age four. Mm-hmm. And I've had some parents bring me their three year old and like mold them now. And I'm thinking, and, and I don't believe in that. They, to me, to me, that's some overzealous dads that are living vicariously to their their sons and their daughters. And they want their sons or daughters to accomplish something that they didn't in their own lifetime. Right. So I've, I've, I've witnessed matches where fathers are berating their child out okay. there. And then as they come off the match, I mean, they're, they, they, they continue berating him and, and they're scolding him. And, and, and there's been on so many occasions where I wanted to walk up to, to dear old dad there and grab him by the scruff of the neck mm-hmm. and start to squeeze a little bit just so I got his attention. And to say, Dad, what is it that you want your five-year-old son to do for you that you didn't do in your own lifetime? I go, and you're driving a wedge between you and your child. Yeah. But it's kind of like going, you know, it's kind of like, uh, I, I've, uh, I have made a few verbal comments to people. I go, you, you may want to rethink what you're doing. Yeah. Now, go on that. Being such an influential and being an influential figure in mixed martial arts, and you know, you started the craze. You were a pioneer, like I've said many a times. What would you personally say your lasting legacy is in this game? Like you said, you're still involved, but what do you think your lasting legacy is going to be? How are people going to remember Dan the Beast ever? One word: inspirational. Done. Moving on after that. What do you plan to do? Why say that? Well, with, with, with all the stuff I continue to do, they're like, well, why do you keep, keep doing it? I go, well, I, I tell them, I like what I do. Like, for example, I'll be on the mats tonight. And uh, I, I, I use a lot of one, one-liners uh, and when I say it, because I, I, a lot of times I, I go out there and I'll be like, I perspire to inspire. I mean, the reality is Father Time is going to win with everybody. Father Time is going to win. But how many people have truly engaged the game of life. I you know I, I tell people I have had three careers so far as an amateur wrestler, professional wrestler, cage fighter. Mm-hmm. I'm starting in, into my fourth career now. I mean, well, I also say two two different aspects. I did my very first professional submission grappling match just this past May. So I'm not done competing. I mean, you know, life, life is competition. We compete. We compete for the best jobs. We compete for significant others. I mean, just you know, bottom line, life is competition. If if if, you, if someone thinks it isn't, they are wrong. Life is competition, and I just don't like. You know, again, I. There's so many things that we can go into again about what, like I said, for what's wrong, and then uh, how people are so lazy. Mm-hmm. It's and like I said, for me, you know, that that joke, the, the turn towards stuff like this. Oh, I know, I could easily do that. 
and I, and I may do it somewhere in the next few years. I'm still doing professional wrestling, for example. I, I'm still going to do that for about four more years, and I, I just kind of, I just pulled it again, that figure out of the top of, of the air. I just figured that well, I'll go until roughly I'm 60, and then I'll probably retire from that industry. I go, but I'll be heavily involved still in that industry, along with my uh, mixed martial arts industry and, and all the other stuff I have going on the farm, the compound. And, uh, I mean, literally, when I say, uh, you know, that uh, I, I'm, a, uh, you know, just, I have so many different things I enjoy doing. I just right. I, I just know that I'll eventually run out of time, but I always tell people, well, I, I plan on living to be 125, and I, I hope to be busy right up until that point in time. Now, moving on, you know, following that, what do you have planned for the future? This will be my final question. What do you have planned for the future? What's the game plan for the beast at the moment? And what do you have on the horizon for yourself, whether it be fan-based, you said you're going to continue wrestling, or just for yourself and your family? Oh, wow. Well, again, my, you know, my kids are get, growing up and, and moving on into their different phases of life, but I still want to do different things with them uh, business-wise, just to, you know, it's the, the generation that's coming up, they need a lot of help. You know, with, again, lack of leadership, uh, the, the burden of, uh, of debt being placed upon them, and uh, just opportunities that just don't really seem to exist in this country as, as abundantly as they once did. So I, I know I'm going to continue to help my own family and to aspire so they, they're all independent uh, on their own, but then also I'd like to be able to do stuff with them so that it helps keeping us in constant contact with each other. I'm still, you know, like the guy that's all over the place, flying by the seat of his pants. Um, you know, that's just that one aspect right there. But as I said before, uh, I know here, and, and you know, you realize the year has less than two months to go. I know out of the ten life-altering type of things that I have on my plate right now, one or two of them are going to hit before the end of the year is out. Mm -hmm. My only really concern is what if half of them hit? Will I be able to do them all? I'm like, yeah, I will. I, I, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll bring more people on board with me, but it'll be more people of my same mindset, uh, drive, and determination. Um, it's uh, I don't believe in coddling anymore. I'd rather I, I refer to myself a lot of times uh, as Frenchy Lafoot. I'm either going to kick you in the hind end and motivate you, or I'm going to kick you in the hind end and get you out of my way. I have more things to do and probably better people to do them with. But yeah, you know, again, as I said, you know, the one word that I will be remember for inspirational because I have defied so many barriers, age-wise, uh, things of that nature. I'll, I'll continue to, to defy those aspects, and I will be changing the face of mixed martial arts for the better on the amateur scene. But I have a few plans for even the pro level that will change the game as we know it. I, I'd like to give you more than that, there, Adam, but it's kind of like, uh, you know, it's, it's, rest assured, the beast has a whole lot going on, and I will continue to have a whole lot going on. And I think you, you should check in with me about every six months just to get an update as to what's happening next. So, I mean, I definitely love to check in in the future so we can guarantee a future interview, yeah? Yes, you know it. All right, man, that's going to do it for us, Dan. Uh, is there anything we missed or anything you want to add in there before we close it down? Well, just to uh, say this, if you, if you would like to know more or keep up a little bit with what I have going on, simply go to dansevern.com. That's my website, dansevern.com. It has all of my social media things set up there for what my Facebook is and what my Twitter account is so that if you want to know what's going on, I do all my own Facebook postings, and, and I can't believe – the responses I've been getting just by doing corny little one-liners here sometimes on, on things. And I will be doing a rant even a little bit later today just about yesterday's flight alone and some of the people that I had to deal with. So, but that's where it, it'll be done in, 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 a, in, in an entertaining tone. So uh, at least some people should get a little chuckle, yuck, yuck out of the whole deal. Well, hey, hey, you know, don't feel bad if you want to mention our interview and maybe plug it a little bit. I wouldn't hate you for it, you know what I mean? <laughs> well, no, not whatsoever. Actually, once, once we're done here, what I'll be telling you is that uh, send me uh, the, the, the uh, contact information, uh, link or something like this. I'll post it right up on my Facebook. I've got no problem with doing that there as well there, Adam. Oh, man. Dan the Beast Severn, it was an absolute honor to share this conversation with you. It truly does mean a lot to me. 
I'm an absolute, you know, fan of yours from day one. All the best in the future, my friend. I appreciate you talking again, and hopefully we can do it again. I hope so as well there, Adam. All right, there we go. Dan Severin joining us on an in-depth piece about the beast and what he's been up to to this day. We appreciate everybody listening. For MMABarn.org, I'm Adam Christ with my guest, Dan the Beast Severin. Stay tuned for all your MMA needs. Check the site and use promo code MMA Chris for your MMA gear discount. Again, Dan, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. All right, we'll talk in the future.